Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for another talk in our series Conversations with the Past. Uh, tonight's speaker is Jillian Mulder, who has been the curator at the Chapman Museum for the past 15 years. Uh, before we get started, I just want to ask everyone to remain on mute throughout the program tonight so that there's no background you know, distractions uh, and feel free to unmute at the end for any questions. Uh, so I'm gonna pass things over to Jillian for her talk, Merriment and Memories, How We Decorated, Celebrated and Made Moments to Remember. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, in just a minute, I will put the presentation on, but um, just, a, just a very quick disclaimer. I'm sure that I will be um, omitting some things that people rem remember fondly and, um, and they're wondering, you know, oh my goodness, you know, why didn't she mention this? Um, when we put these programs together, we work with what we have at the museum in our collections and archives. Um, obviously, they depend a lot on visuals, so um, I can only, you know, use what what I have available to me, um, and so that kind of uh, guides the course that the programs take. Um, if anyone has photos related to the holidays when they were here uh, and would like to donate them, we are more than happy to have uh, photographs. Uh, more recent photographs in our collection. We have very few. Um, and also, you know, this is pretty much exclusively Christmas related. And um, I would I would very much like to include um, Hanukkah and other celebrations um, that people do. But again, we don't have any images. We don't have any materials. So if anyone knows of anyone who has those materials and would like to donate them, uh, please send them our way because then then they can be included. So, all right, I'm going to uh, get started here. So this is called Merriment and Memories, How We Decorated, Celebrated, and Made Memories. Uh, basically, I start in the early 1900s because that's when, um, that's when our images that we have kind of starts. And really, the, the thrust of the way that we celebrate Christmas and the holidays today is based on probably like the, around the 1920s, 1930s. Um, that's, when the, that's when the model pretty much uh, was, was founded for how we do things today, especially with decorating. So, and I, as I said, you'll see uh, our traditions reflected in these early pictures. This is how they got started. So I start with the 1920s and here are some really neat um, 1920s Christmas cards. Uh, greeting cards got their, started, got their start in the late 1800s. Um, and that was mostly because of uh, improvements to the technology and printing. And also uh, the postal system um, was more regular and families were kind of spreading out and moving across the country and people needed a way to keep in touch with each other. Um, so Christmas cards is one of our oldest traditions and, uh, and it's, you know, we still do that today. And these are just some of the really, really neat cards. Um, this is one of the earliest Christmas photos that we have dating to 1920 and it's the Glens Falls Insurance Company. As you can see, it's not really decorated all that much because uh, lights were just starting to catch on at this time, but they do have two trees out front. It's kind of minimal decorating, um, but you'll see that change very rapidly in just the next couple of years. Um, we had just come out of the First World War and people needed, uh, needed to celebrate something, needed to have some color and some lights, um, and we will see those beginning to appear. Also, the economy started to pick up and the shopping craze that uh, we associate with the holidays today uh, really got their start around that time. And here are just a few quick ads from a 1925 newspaper in Glens Falls. As you can see, 
electricity is going to be a, a big theme. You've got the electric lights, um, you've got electric uh, appliances. A lot is going to be based on this uh, new electric world that we're that we're coming into. And here are a few other things. Here's a, a quick snippet from the ads in the newspaper uh, regarding things that you could purchase that were Christmas related. And as you can see on the side there, we've got Christmas lights from M. Lapham Sons. We've got Christmas trees. We've got Christmas wrappings from Russell and Waite. Um, tree, uh, Christmas tree light sets from the Electric Art Studio. Ribbon candy from Dolan's Luncheonette. And before we really see some of the, the interesting photos, just very, just a, a quick background on Christmas lights. And I, a lot of this I didn't know, and, and I find it really interesting. So lights got their debut in 1882. And then shortly after they started to commercially produce the pre-wired sets. But in 1908, um, insurance companies eliminated the protection for fires that started with lit, candles on Christmas trees. And I think that turns out to be a, a big factor in, in people switching from candles from the Victorian period uh, to the electric lights. And, uh, and by the 1920s, Christmas lights become incredibly popular and just continue to grow in popularity. And one of the biggest names in, in Christmas lights is the Noma Company. It actually started as uh, a number of smaller, uh, smaller manufacturers, and uh, in 1927 they they consolidated and formed Noma, and that turns out to be uh, the predominant manufacturer of Christmas lights up until the 1960s. So we have people moving from those candles to their bright electric lights. And Noma would, um, would kind of uh, dominate that market until the 1960s, at which point it went bankrupt. And uh, it's thought that that was due to the fact that these aluminum Christmas trees were beginning to trend and you couldn't mix the aluminum with electric lights because of the danger of uh, being shocked and possibly even electrocuted. <laughs> I had no idea about that. So here's one of our, our really neat pictures of the downtown Glen Street in Christmas 1927. And I, I, just, I just love this. All the downtowns started to, uh, to decorate all across America. But if you read some of the newspapers from that time period, uh, outside, you know, people visiting the area from outside were commenting very frequently about how wonderfully decorated the downtown was. And as you can see here, we've got a lot of the tinsel swags. These would have been covered with lights. Um, I think that the, uh, the star um, may be a reference to Henry Crandall, although it could simply be a, a star. I'm not exactly sure, but I just think the scene is so festive. Um, you know, even though it's not in color, it still gives off that that vibe. And as you can see along the sidewalks too, um, every few feet there was a Christmas tree. And I forget exactly how many they had that year, but um, it, it was quite a large number of Christmas trees that decorated the sidewalks. And this was all put together um, by, the, uh, by the Chamber of Commerce or, or the merchants at that time. And one of the main focuses downtown that, um, that you'll see is the Glens Falls Insurance Company and how they decorate their building. That was always uh, a big, big draw. And I, I wish so much that the building was still there today. It just is, it's, it's really a focal point for downtown. And this one is from 1927. And, and a year later, they, they changed their decorations a little bit. We have quite a few photographs in our collection from 
um, from the Glens Falls Insurance Company simply it, because it was so photogenic. A lot of people like to take pictures of the, of the, uh, of the building decorated. Uh, in this year, they, they decorated all along the rooftop there with, I, I think about 30 small Christmas trees and then along um, between the, the ground floor and the first floor, as well as the large wreath. And then on the, on the right-hand side, you see it all lit up. It's really beautiful. So this is a, a picture again of Glen Street. And I believe that's also 1928. And th in this year, the outing club, the Glens Falls Outing Club um, decides to hold a contest to see what houses decorate the best and they give their decoration suggestions. And then you could fill out a registration form and participate. And it says that it was open to uh, any home in Glens Falls, South Glens Falls, Hudson Falls and Fort Edward. And then just a year later, here's another image of the insurance company. I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't get tired of seeing these, uh, these decorations on the insurance company. And I found these ads in, in the paper from 1928, I believe. Um, so they're showing you what kinds of things were being available for purchase for kids, um, toys for the little folks at Bickley's, and all of the, uh, the, the newfangled electric appliances that were available for the older crowd at Bates and, and Carmody. You got radios and irons, vacuums, all that fun stuff. Now, I think this, uh, this ad uh, dates to 1928, just before Prohibition. And I, I found it kind of funny that up in the corner was this, uh, this image of Santa and he's winking and pointing at the ads. And if you go to the bottom of the, uh, the ads, there is um, holiday dinner with a ready mixed cocktail. And you can buy that for $2 at Burns Wine and Liquor Store. So people were having a good time in, 19, in, the, in the late 1920s. As you get into the 1930s, these cards change again and you're seeing more of the Art Deco influence and candles um, appear often on cards at that time. The two on the, uh, on the sides there on the left and the right, those are homemade Christmas cards that we have in our collection. They're actually uh, cut out and then there's uh, the colored backing behind them. And I guess people were, were kind of looking back at the nostalgia of the Victorian period and, and at those candles that they used to put out. So you'll see that a lot. And in 1930, you have Whitman's by their chocolate samplers. And we have an ad for Christmas trees that you could purchase in Hudson Falls. A few more nice images of the front of the insurance company building. Um, I believe this is 1933 or 34 and they had a magnificent wreath that hung just above the front door. I mean, it's just so grand. Then in, in 1934 also, you have insurance company employees uh, organizing a, a food drive for, for the needy. And in this particular year, they gathered um, 50 baskets of food materials for complete dinners for, for, for the families. And this was a tradition, I guess, that they started in 1930 and they continued for quite a while. And here you have uh, some of the employees getting those all together. And then here's a picture of the, the baskets. And then all the baskets had chicken and ham, vegetables, some dessert items. Uh, sometimes clothing was included. So in, in Glens Falls and, and around the, the area, there is a long tradition of um, helping others in need. I came across a, a lot of information about um, church groups and other community organizations 
uh, gathering funds and food and clothing to make sure that everyone had a, a happy holiday. And another tradition that started in the early 1930s is the J.R. McMullen residence at 401 Glen Street. And this must have been really quite a sight. Um, J.R. McMullen started early buying decorations from Germany. And a lot of, a lot of uh, our holiday decorations were coming from Germany at that time. And he did his house up in a big way. And a lot of the, uh, the decorations that you'll see in the front uh, consist of gnomes. And at that time, gnomes were very popular, uh, especially overseas. And then he brought them here to America. So here are some of his, uh, his gnomes set up. He has a band here playing, as well as two watchmen. I believe there's uh, 12 or 13 all together. And then behind them is uh, a miniature chateau. I, a, a couple of years later, he added um, the Notre Dame Cathedral reproduction. And of course he has to put some more gnomes out front of that. And then as well, he has this belfry and it's, uh, it was huge. It was 10 feet high. And then it had a, a mechanism inside where the gnomes appeared to be pulling the bells, ringing the bells. And I'll say too that uh, for the cathedral, um, he actually had music piped out and he had, he had a record player playing in his house and speakers in, in the yard um, hidden in the bushes so that you would hear Christmas music playing um, you know, while you're watching the gnomes ring the bells and, uh, and they have their little scenes set up. I, apparently he would also invite choirs to sing and uh, there are accounts of over a thousand people at one time just filing through to see. Yeah, I really like this image. These photos mostly were taken by uh, Soter, the Glens Falls photographer, and they're really well done. Here you have it snowing. You see the belfry off to the left and the gnomes and the gnome home at the center. Then in the 1940s, you see things changing. These cards are just, just beautiful, I think. Wonderful graphics. And of course, uh, right at the turn of uh, 1939, 1940, you've got World War II going on and the cards reflect that sometimes as well. And these are from 1943. These are uh, a series of storefront images at Merkel and Gelman and they have to do with uh, the World War II theme. So in this one, um, if you look down to the right bottom at, at, in the image, there's a little book and the quote that's off to the right is, is actually what's written in the book. So there's a woman there and she's daydreaming about uh, her, her loved one off in the war. And here's a, a second storefront window from Merkel and Gelman. And this is the third, these are all 1943. So you can see all the storefronts would be decorated. This is just a really cute image that I came across. We, we, we almost have no images of kids decor or, or celebrating, um, which is really too bad, but this is a fun one that was taken at the Broad Street School in 1943. And this is the, Frank uh, Douglas family. And of course, around this time, Douglas Crockwell uh, rises in popularity. He does uh, a number of World War II 
propaganda, propaganda posters and uh, becomes a very well-known, well-respected commercial artist. And of course, he used a lot of people from the Glens Falls area as his models. Some of them we, we know and we can attribute who the people were, but um, some of them we can't. But these could all you know, certainly be Glens Falls. So at the left, I have a Douglas Crockwell image from 1948, as well as an image to the right of the Glens Falls Insurance Company post-party cleanup. We have the, the pre and the post. And also 1948, Douglas Crockwell, the family gathered around the tree just after having unwrapped their presents. And, uh, and that's along with the, a Kresge's ad. So that would have been one of the places that you would stop and buy all of your, all of your Christmas needs. I love the paper chains on the tree here. And then of course the train set and the doll. Douglas Crockwell did a lot of holiday scenes. And I know that some of them were uh, based on people here in Glens Falls. These are uh, ads that he did for an association of beer manufacturers. So you have people decorating. And then we get into the 1950s. You have Santa and his rocket from the TV. I love that. Here's another Douglas Crockwell looking at Christmas cards, 1953. And here's the Christmas tree at the Glens Falls Insurance Company. A lot of tinsel on that tree. As well as uh, workers in the offices. These are some terrific pictures taken by Francis Bale. And uh, these are downtown. I think these are these are some of the uh, the most exciting downtown festive images that I've seen. Lots of lots of decorations, lots of color, lots of lights, garlands hung. Here's the front of the Fowler store. Here's a little close up of uh, one of the windows, one of the store windows. I really wish I could just step inside these, these pictures. I'll look down Glen Street, Airlangers. On, the, on, the, on this side, you've got JJ uh, Burns. The stores would be open late so people could keep shopping. And this, this uh, photograph came in relatively recently. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. It's 19, 1957, I believe. Um, and this would be in Mon uh, Monument Park in Hudson Falls, Mr. and Mrs. Santa Claus. And I believe that these were made by Max Topper, um, either that or the West Sign Company. And these would move. There was a, 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 a mechanism in these so that you know Santa's hand moved and um, they were pretty elaborate. And then these are, oh, I'm sorry, 1959. Now these were done by Max Tupper. And Max Tupper lived on, uh, I believe it was Sanford Street and he would do an enormous display each year that he, he would add on to it each year. Um, he was a, a sign painter. He did sculptural work, a lot of wooden cutouts. Um, and he did this specifically for his daughter who had cerebral palsy. And he did a lot of fundraising for um, the association uh, for cerebral palsy. 
raising money for them and uh, awareness because of his daughter. And since she couldn't really get out of the house much and, and go looking around at all the lights around town, he made displays for his front yard. And each year he would add, do a little bit more and a little bit more. And they must have just been fantastic. And there's accounts of people, you know, the cars and the people just backing up for, for quite a distance, people waiting to file by to see. Um, and on the right there, that's uh, Tupper's tiny theater. He had, he, he did all these little Disney figures and they moved and there was music, they sang. Uh, at one point, I believe there was a 24 foot rotating tree. Um, and then also uh, this Santa and reindeer display. So we get into the 1960s and 70s. One of the big events in the 1960s, actually there were two, was that uh, we had two local trees selected to be the national Christmas tree, which is a pretty incredible honor that in, in one decade, two trees came from this area. And in 1964, uh, the white spruce came from Pottersville. And what's unique about this tree is that uh, unlike most other national Christmas trees, this one had a cross on the top. And President Johnson spoke of, of peace and hope. And I think that was, you know, the, the cross on the top was from, from his decision. And it was labeled as the best they had ever had by the Federal Bureau of Parks referring to the trees, to the tree. And here's a, a color image of that. This is an oversized color image that we have in our collection. Pretty fantastic. Here are a few uh, newspaper ads or, or newspaper clippings from when that tree was cut down. And there is the, the tree being hauled away. Here's just a nice family dinner photo that we have of, uh, I believe this is the photographer, the Glens Falls photographer, James Mann and his wife, uh, the older couple in the back. And some 1960s, uh, well, the, the one on the left is uh, a Richard Dean photograph. And I love the, the, the 60s decorations that are, are out the big candy cane. And then on the right, you can see the oversized Christmas ornament. And those ornaments are actually still being used in the display at Monument Park in Hudson Falls. So if you wanna see some retro vintage um, ornaments, check that out. Then again, in 1969, we had our second national Christmas tree and this one came from Crandall Park. And it had originally uh, been planted, I believe, in 1909 by a Boy Scout troop. So that had a pretty neat ending. It was an, another Norway spruce, or I should say a Norway spruce. And Queensbury is not left out either. This is the uh, Queensbury Plaza. Where, um, where the Olive Garden is today. And they had, now I don't know if this is the same decoration as, as is seen in other photographs, they're very similar. I haven't been able to confirm that or not, but um, they have their Santa and sleigh up. And this is a more recent image. Again, like I said, um, they still hang those vintage ornaments in Hudson Falls. And I'm sure a lot of people recognize this, this house 
This is on Clayton Avenue. This is the Smith family. And for the last, oh, about oh, 40, 40 years, 50, no, 40, I guess, um, they have been doing a massive Christmas display. And what's really neat, again, like I said, uh, they use it as an opportunity to contribute to the local food pantries. And they ask people to please, you know, bring a can of food and drop it in the box. So there's over 12,000 lights. And then there's about 30 push buttons where there's all kind of interactive displays. Uh, I believe there's a nativity display that was originally um, uh, belonging to Charlie Wood. And it either came from Storytown or Magic Forest. I, I don't quite remember which one, but, but I know it was owned by Charlie Wood. I, I think he has a little plaque on it. So in 2018, he was able to collect, or the family, I should say, was able to collect over 200 pounds of food from their holiday display. I don't know about any of you, but m m growing up in Queensbury, my family on Christmas Eve, we would always uh, do a drive around after church and we would look at all the houses. We would go, we, we would go to certain houses because we knew that they'd be very much decorated. Um, and we kind of had a, a route that we went on. And this was one of the houses that we always had to stop at. And it's one that I bring my son to now. And this is another really, uh, I, I, I'd say like a, a National Lampoon uh, <laughs> Christmas vacation house. Uh, this is uh, Jim Archer's house on, on Bay. And he says, sometimes they call it a gingerbread house but he goes overboard as well. Um, Santa, he has a, a Santa that dances in the front yard and, uh, and he also puts on quite a Halloween display if you've ever stopped over there. And he too um, will collect food donations. And here are just some random other houses. I believe one's on Montcalm. I really love it when people just go nuts with their lights. Uh, this is a, your, your plastic uh, mold, Santa and reindeer. This is sometimes displayed um, on the corner of Quaker and Lafayette at the uh, auto place. That, that person, that gentleman, he likes to decorate a lot as well. This is his nativity scene that he sometimes puts out. And then in Queensbury and in, on uh, Helen Drive and Heinrich Circle, what's known as Evergreen Estates, um, on Christmas Eve, they do a lot of luminaries. So if you drive by on Christmas Eve, uh, a, a lot of the uh, people will have their luminaries out. And of course, I hope nobody's missed this, but uh, this year, Queensbury has the honor of having the Rockefeller Center tree. And as you can see on the left, that's what it looked like before. And on the right, you can see what it looks like today. I haven't had a chance yet to go down and visit it, but I hope to. Um, it is, I wanna say 80 feet tall, but it might not be quite that tall. Um, it was donated by uh, Neil Leibowitz's family and the, the lead horticultural, horticulturalist from Rockefeller Center, his name was Eric Pausch. He came to Glens Falls originally to look at a tree that someone had sent him a photograph of. And as he was driving into town, he saw this tree. And on his way out, he took another look at it and said, that's the one I want. And in the year or so, I believe that he's, you know, has decided that that was going to be the tree. He's been making trips back here um, to water and fertilize the tree, um, make sure that, you know, it was in good shape to be harvested this year. Um, 
So a lot of planning was involved. And then of course there was the big reveal. And if you followed uh, along as it was being wrapped up and cut, it was just an amazing, incredible process. So it's pretty neat that we have three, um, three nationally recognized trees. I don't think too many other communities can say that. And I will just end with this little snip that I was that I found about uh, how you can tell what's inside your package. And the uh, the newspaper clipping recommends holding it up to the light like you would candle an egg. I don't really know if that would work, but I thought that was kind of strange. I prefer the shaking method, so. That's gonna to end tonight's uh, program. There's so much more that could have been included. It was actually, it was, it was a lot of fun to put it together, but it was also kind of daunting because there was just so much information.